Hi, everyone. First of all, a quick correction. I think the agenda showed my uh, co-founder's name. So I assure you the presentation is pretty much the same, but there's a slight difference between uh, him presenting and I'm presenting. He has lots of hair, I don't. And he has a PhD in optics, I don't. So just bear with me. OK. Um, we're a startup out of San Jose. We're around 17 people right now. Uh, and the core of what we're working on is computational holography. Our first application will be enterprise AR, but we have in our product roadmap uh, HUD uh, and uh, consumer AR and VR as well. So this is a nice graph we like. Uh, I think it summarizes our vision uh, pretty well. We like to help uh, humankind to be able to look up again and kind of free himself, herself from those little screens we're all addicted to, unfortunately. Um, so what are the key factors for mass adaption? Oops, not these ones. <laughs> there are actually five factors we can group things under. The first one is uh, image quality, but I'll wait for the slide to show up. Okay. So image quality is, of course, the most critical one. Everything uh, related to, you know, retinal resolution, um, high contrast, pixel size, even low latency, I think, should be grouped under image quality, uh, which is, again, number one criteria for any display solution. The second one is form factor and user experience. I believe in terms of image quality, we are almost there, as we've just seen from the previous presentation and so many examples out there. Uh, we're getting, you know, where we want to be. But in terms of form factor, we've all been chasing the eyeglasses form factor. We've made a lot of progress in terms of industry, but still a uh, way to go. Uh, user experience, the way we define is kind of getting something out of the box like your phone, your, your, uh, like uh, smart speakers, and making it work. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case for most of the AR and VR headsets today, it takes good 30 minutes to an hour, so uh, still we have to work on it more uh, as an industry. Content-wise, uh, you know, this year has been a good year with uh, AR kits, uh, AR core, which will pave the way for the uh, future of AR. Uh, there are already, you know, around one billion devices now with, you know, AR technology. Uh, so that will help the content developers to come up with new content. Uh, Cost-wise, again, I believe we made a good progress now. You know, there are headsets out there starting from a couple hundreds to a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and also we see now phone prices also uh, getting, you know, around thousand dollars. So we don't think that cost is a major barrier anymore. Now, we like to introduce visual comfort as a standalone separate topic. Uh, for us, for all of us to pay attention to, which uh, I believe sometimes is overlooked uh, and it could be really critical for the mass adoption. So when we look at current landscape for enterprise AR, we see that, you know, there are really good examples out there. Uh, HoloLens, um, even with their first product, uh, they've done a great job to put everything together. Very low latency. Uh, Vuzix, high frame per second. ODG is, you know, pretty good in terms of form factor and resolution, and Meta 2 gave us uh, a great uh, field of view. Uh, and again, for all of us who are attending this conference, probably we're hoping uh, AR, VR to follow the similar path to other technologies. It took around 30 years for computers to get from 2% to 70%. Uh, same thing, only eight years for smartphones. We've, we've been hoping the same thing to be um, real for XR. We're still waiting. Uh, but the, of course, the real potential is XR to be the new computing platform, not just a tool for enterprise or not just a gaming platform. Uh, again, for all of us who've been in technology business long enough, we know that there are some technologies really picking up fast. Sometimes, though, they stall for a long period of time and come back. As AI is a great example. You know, it came back pretty big right now, but uh, that wasn't the case 10 years ago. 
Um, and there are some technologies which pretty much fails. Uh, we, you know, I believe that there are some learnings from those technologies uh, as well. I like to give an example of 3D TV, which we all were very excited at one point. And they've done a great job in terms of really picking up the sales. Almost like 20% of the total sales were in uh, 3D TV at one point. Um, but at, you know, as of last year or you know, in 2016, most of the large producers stopped producing 3D TV. So what happened? What can we learn from this example? Well, if you look at the same five criteria, actually, uh, image quality was definitely there. I mean, in fact, people bought 3D TV because it was uh, having a better image quality compared to 2D TV. Form factor, yes, you had to have glasses, and it's kind of a hindrance. Um, and cost-wise, it was now getting pretty cheap comparable to 2D TV cost. And you had to pay extra like 50, 60 bucks for active glasses or like 10, 20 bucks for uh, you know, passive glasses. Definitely not a major reason for, uh, you know, the failure. Uh, content, yeah, it's always cash 22, but there has been great networks getting in in terms of like sports and some great uh, movies, but probably not enough. Uh, visual comfort, um, you know, if we need to single out one thing, probably what consumers told us was, you know, Around 10% didn't feel comfortable at all. Like around 30, 40% felt some kind of uh, discomfort, uh, which you know TV should be a pleasant, you know, pleasant experience. So that's why we think you know visual comfort is um, a standalone topic we should pay attention to. Now research estimates that most of our cognition comes from uh, our vision. Uh, so we define visual comfort as the natural viewing experience in harmony the way our brain and eye system works. So the more closer we can get how our brain and eye functions, the better. Uh, today, um, OK, what defines natural vision is like three major components, virgins and accommodation. Uh, we heard some of it uh, today. Uh, having the right depth cues. Uh, and natural blur. So when we look at uh, these three components, actually, they interact with each other very closely. I mean, there is a closely integrated feedback loop between these three based on the blur, depth of focus, uh, and disparity. So to Unfortunately, today, when we look at the market, everything is based on what is called stereoscopic principles. Uh, you can take it back to 50, 60 years, or all the way 200 years. You know, the first one looks pretty much like Google Cardboard, actually. So uh, not much change in terms of optical principles. Uh, we're still using stereoscopic um, glasses. And um, unfortunately, they have three major shortcomings. Virgins and accommodation conflict is almost you know, always there. And it's more severe when the objects are uh, closer to our eye. It's one fixed depth plane. And it, again, it has to be beyond arm's length, a major hurdle for any interactive scenarios or like any enterprise use cases. And no natural focus blur. So these are, let's get into that, you know, these topics a little bit in more detail. Our eyes are used to see where they look at. So you see on the left how it, how it works uh, in you know, reality. But in um, HMD cases, we have a screen, which is the source of the light, where our eyes are forced to accommodate. But also, we have virtual object in front or on the back of the screen where our eyes are trying to verge. So this disparity, this difference, is not something our brains are wired to handle. And again, it becomes more severe when the virtual objects are really close to our eye. The second one is you know, natural blur. Our eyes are great machines. You know, like we call it retinal blur. It has very high um, you know, uh, focus point. A resolution at the center around 15 degrees, but
but it drops significantly. I mean, here you can't tell your fingerprints. Uh, here you cannot tell even if you have four or five fingers. So unfortunately, with today's displays, everything is in focus, sharp, or out of focus. So we don't have natural blur. Um, yes, we're able to show uh, objects at fixed, uh, you know, beyond arm's length in focus, but nothing, as I said, uh, close to our eyes. So all these combined, when we ask the users, almost 40% express some kind of discomfort, you know, in terms of noisia, headache, dizziness. Everyone loves it for the first 20 minutes, you know, but people do not put it on and on afterwards. You know, we all heard about the importance of the sticky killer apps and all that, but it's not, you know, users are really giving us a message that, you know, it's great, but not for, you know, extended usage. And there are some studies showing, you know, um, 80% complaint rate. There are warning signs, signs on Oculus and HoloLens stating that it's not good for youth, you know. So with those warnings and, you know, uh, messages from consumers, uh, we don't think any technology could be mass adapted until we overcome these issues. Uh, there's a nice video by Oculus. I'll just show the beginning. When you look at a nearby object, your eyes focus to that point, blurring background objects. When you look at the background objects, the reverse happens and the foreground blurs. Conventional VR headsets consist of a screen and an eyepiece, basically a magnifying glass, which makes the screen look larger and further away from your face than it actually is. When you look through the headset at a mid-range object, the magnified screen comes into focus about where your eyes are focused. However, if you look at the foreground object, your eyes try to focus to that distance which doesn't match the focus of the screen. This effect means that you can only see a sharp image of virtual objects that are around the same focus as the magnified screen and everywhere else is incorrectly blurry. If we consider a 3D scene, the conventional headset puts the entire image onto one slice in depth. Someday we may use holography to generate the correct light paths into our eyes to accurately depict scenes, but this isn't practical with existing technology. I think Oculus Research has done a great job in terms of putting this video. Um, you can watch the full video online. Uh, we just, you know, show here like the beginning. Uh, and as you can guess, we're uh, suggesting holography as the ultimate solution to overcome these issues and provide the best uh, and uh, natural vision. Why? Because there is no VAC conflict with computational holography. The images are created on the retina. Uh, it's continuous depth. You can show pretty much from near eye all the way to infinity. Uh, and it's natural focus blur based on where your eyes are focused, objects are in or out of focus. So it is the most natural way of viewing, actually, providing the best visual comfort. Uh, this is a chart from uh, Stanford Computational Imaging Conference Series uh, Garden has put in place. Uh, and you could see that holography is actually uh, based on all the criteria is the, you know, uh, the best technology, possible technology out there. The trade-off is uh, the computational cost. So how does it work out? Well, if you want to show the virtual objects, you know, we have to uh, manipulate the light in such a way that it would be reflected the way if there was a, let's say, uh, you know, engine out there, uh, the light would be reflected. So that's what we try to do with holography. So in our case, with our technology, we have a point light source. It could be LED or laser. Hitting special light modulator. Again, in our case, we have our own post-processing applied to it and our own uh, LC. Now, what happens is once the light is reflected from SLM, <laughs> the images are created on the retina. Uh, so there is no image on the SLM. That's a major difference from other displays. What you would see is, you know, if you look at it um, on the display, uh, you would see this computer-generated hologram, which is just a decoded version of the image. The image, the real image, gets um, real only on the retina. And we're creating the whole uh, volumetric uh, display here. It, for giving the information for all objects in that scene. So based on, again, where you're looking at, the images are in focus or blurred. 
We think that this is the uh, you know, future of um, display technology. Um, and there are, of course, challenges with um, any uh, new cutting edge technology out there. Uh, we think the first use cases will be with enterprise AR. Uh, again, for several reasons. All the frontline workers and the you know, use cases require interaction with the virtual objects less than arm's length. That's a major shortcoming of stereoscopic displays. And also, you don't want someone to put half an hour, an hour, and get you know, kind of dizzy. You want people to be able to use it eight to 10 hours. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of use cases there. Uh, remote collaboration, we heard a lot uh, today, um, is really picking up. Um, and prototyping, uh, quality control, technical support, uh, training and education. Those are all great applications of our display solution, we believe, for anyone who wants to build their enterprise head-mounted display solution. So we're not in the business of producing our own headsets. We're a technology company purely focused on um, perfecting computational holography as a display solution for anyone who wants to use it. Now, like some shots from our display, uh, you, here the camera is focused on uh, the you know, large text. Now, both virtual objects are at different depth level. And you see that when the camera is focused here, that object is sharp. And when we change the focus of the camera, uh, you know, it becomes blurred. So this is, again, a little video. Um, there is no technology out there which could move two text in space like this in depth and having the right depth and focus blur other than computational holography. Um, this is another one. If you just focus on one depth level, you see the text becoming uh, sharp and then blurred again. <coughs> I'll skip this one, but you can see how bright it is. You know, um, one of our engineers shot it when <laughs> some car was passing by. So in summary, we put in place world's first uh, computational holographic display for near eye. Uh, it's the most natural and comfortable uh, display out there. Uh, and we are able to show continuous depth with right uh, focus blur. Uh, and um, you don't need a bunch of lenses to create each additional plane. So form factor wise, it's a great uh, improvement. Um, Thank you for being here, uh, and I wish the best for the rest of the conference. Our contact information is uh, up there if you want to get in touch or have any questions. Thank you. Thank you.